thought I want to I meant, mention that I've, I've known Tom by reputation for quite a while, but we started a few months ago kind of just conversing on Skype and comparing our histories. And, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, I've kind of backed away. I was invited to get involved in healthcare, and I said, oh, too complicated. And, you know, I think Tom's felt the same way, but is kind of getting more engaged in it and uh, wants to uh, take the kind of conversation we were having up a level and take it where he can take it to people who really need to hear it. Yeah, well, Ward, uh, same, same thing. I've known Ward by reputation and by his writing before I even knew him for quite a while. And uh, Ward's uh, it's been very exciting to talk to him on, on Skype. So when I found out about Health Camp, I said, hey, can I also do a, a tape of video interview for this? So that's kind of how this ended up. So it, it's a little bit of Hollywood for 30 minutes, if you don't mind. And then we'd open up for discussions. But I, I think, I hope there's a, an enduring uh, value here. I wanted to start a question with you, Ward. Uh, you know, the wiki is one of your many accomplishments, and it's uh, you know kind of become a, a worldwide phenomenon. The, you could probably write spy sellers about WikiLeaks and Wikipedia and everything. So wiki's everywhere. But to start that, I mean, tell me a little bit about it. I mean, how big a staff did you have? How many lawyers? How many five-year plans? And, and how did you administer this thing? Well, uh, of course, you get a lot of freedom when you just do something for free, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's freedom in producing as well as uh, consuming. And I, uh, I did it because I saw the need. And I, and I also say that uh, uh, the computer network was emerging. Someone had this idea of having all the computer networks work together so that we really have one network. And, and by the way, it doesn't have to be that way, but they chose to make it that way out of some sort of idealism. And I said, hey, I can figure out what to do with that. Now, I already had a community. I had about 500 people were on an email list, and we were talking about changing the literature of computer programming. We thought that the literature didn't jive with the experience, and we wanted to fix that. And, and uh, I said, well, you know, I'll get on the internet, and I'll make a little repository, and, and the rest is history. So how, how complicated was the first wiki? Well, it's about, I think, 300 lines of uh, oh. Perl code. I, I wrote it in a couple of days. And I uh, just got on the computer and started using it. And, and I said, this is it. I could tell it was what I wanted. It had a feel that I'd experienced before. Experiment, my, my first experience with hypertext was with HyperCard. And I had kind of twisted it around backwards so you could do this kind of top-down authoring. And it. Uh, you know, it, it, I could tell it felt right, and so I invited in my friends. Now, I think that what, what we both realized is that was actually a pretty profound feat. And, and, the, and what, what happens is I was doing a lot of kind of engineering of community, you know, maybe by the seat of my pants, but I wanted this to to have a behavior, and I was more interested in the behavior than the, the technology. And this is, you know, I know Tom did the same thing, uh, you know, looking at uh, small computers and saying, you know, and I, of course, I felt the same way. The hierarchy I was concerned with was all those uh, academics writing textbooks on how to write a computer program when they had never written a computer program. And uh, I just wanted the people who were writing computer programs that shipped you know, to talk about that experience. And, and we created that environment, and it's changed how computer programming is done. But the, the you know, what kind of ties us together is this notion that what we did was simple. Right. And when we see people doing something incredibly complicated, and you look at that and you say, well, that's never going to work. Yeah. You know, maybe not because it's complicated, but because it doesn't even understand this power relationship. So, so what I'm getting to there is, is, did you have a sense that what you were doing needed to be simple, or was it more about that relationship? Well, I don't think we could afford a complex solution. I think if we had more money and more staff, we would have never gotten where we got. So, so um, it was out of necessity that you were forced to be simple, and simple worked. Yeah, yeah. And I, I look at, what if the Department of Education decided to put a, an online encyclopedia funded with $20 billion and go to all the stakeholders in Encyclopedia Britannica, World Book, and define a consumer empowerment so they'd make sure that the people could read the right information and that Encyclopedia would get reimbursed for their links to World Book. And 
They'd have standards committee to make sure that the encyclopedias were controlled by experts and had no redundancy. Oh, okay. What would have happened with that? Yeah, well, we would know have, what would happen. Yeah, right. and $20 billion would have gone to Encyclopedia Britannica, but Wikipedia wouldn't have happened. So yes. if you look at the history of Ameri uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, they quote the fact that John D. Rockefeller refused to fund their original uh, request, uh, saying these local chapters have to be self-sufficient. So today, they, they, they attribute the fact that they were underfunded to their success as an organization for addiction and 12-step program. So there's, there, I think there's tremendous virtue in starting with a group that's incentivized to start simple, uh, do what's good enough to get the community going, and getting the feedback very tightly coupled with the success of the system. And I, I think that we can look towards that for the future, for the next generation of health IT, to start that way, rather than throw everything on the garage floor and say we have 492 parts, we need to plug them all together, and we need 4,792 uh, uh, standards committees to get these parts to fit. I, I think we need to come through with a new vision of what health is and start with that and then drop down to the, the, the components. Well, I, I think we should get to that, but before I do, I want to, I, I want to go back to this, uh, this notion of what did people need to know about the nature of the computer system that they were working with and bring that up to date. Uh, for, for example, it's one thing to say community, you know, in 78, or, or, or even uh, 95 in my case, and, uh, and now, you know, s since the movie, the social network, everybody is a social network engineer, <laughs> and, and all the money is going into this network, that network, whatever network, I think that the community is much more sophisticated in what they think success looks like and that it might actually uh, get in the way of, of applying community. Do you, have, do you have a sense of that or, or, or are we still, the people that matter are really kind of stuck in this top down thing and they, and they wouldn't know well, social network if they saw it? Well, I think there's a bunch of dimensions here. One is the older generation does not. They don't care. Think about that. Uh, they're, they're not even on email in case. Yeah. So the, 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 the really high cost elderly patients on the system are not uh, web savvy. And then mm -hmm. there's the middle generation that's kind of email oriented and then there's the younger that's Twitter and text oriented, shall we say, or Facebook. So the Facebook people, this is just their normal lives and that's mm -hmm. their, their, their connectivity to the world. Um, the, but it, it's more than just um, Facebook but it's the, the metaphor of, of a network model as opposed to a hierarchical model in the social network analysis. Uh, James Fowler has a very good book called uh, Connected with uh, Nicholas Christakis, I think his name is, talking about the, the effects that your social network has on your health. So I studied the Framingham Heart. And this is in your real life social network, not yes. on a, any computer program. So we went back to the Framingham Heart Data Study, which was a gold standard for longitudinal studies of healthcare, and he said who's related to whom through various network uh, analysis tools. And he found all these effects of obesity, uh, depression, happiness, addiction, I'm not sure all they found there. But uh, the, the, your connections have great effect on you even uh, one link away. So it's, it's not a matter of Facebook so much, but it's looking at healthcare through a networked model of, of social and community involvement and how that affects you. And then if you could start talking about the, the key connectors in this um, network, uh, the, the, the nodal points and affecting them, or maybe vaccinating them in the case of a, an epidemic or something, uh, and, and looking at the, the network effect in the, in the community. So I, I, I guess that's um, part of this whole model that uh, Jonas Salk said, uh, we need to create an epidemic of health. And uh, the idea of having this viral spread of the positive, uh, then from that you can still deal with disease, but you've got this, this positive network and community of pulling people together around uh, health and vitality and then dropping down into the disease state, but you don't start with the disease state. Well, there, there was something that, that kind of surfaced uh, on, on my wiki. The first wiki was devoted to uh, basically writing about successful software and, and kind of evolved to be about uh, 
uh, kind of how people should interact, what should happen. And we asked people to talk to each other, or in fact, shoulder to shoulder program together, and that the kind of conversation they would have was more valuable than anything they could even read online. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, uh, computer programming was sufficiently complex that uh, being able to say, yeah, like that thing right there and point to the screen when it just happened would, would uh, change the vocabulary. Of course, I also made it so that every, every page name, you had to use the page name. And if you learned the page name, you could write better on my wiki. And so part of just participating was learning the names of things, you know, thousands of names of things. And, and that carried with them off of the computer, you know, in yeah. the conversation in the hallway, they now had a vocabulary to talk about the experience of delivering software that was overlooked by classical computer programming texts. I had a very similar experience with the VA when I came in there. I realized these the people weren't talking to each other. I, I got pulled aside by the chief of psychology saying, by the way, when you automate these records and this information, don't let those psychiatrists get into our records. You know? <laughs> so my original privacy was to keep the shrinks out of the, well, psychology, psychiatrists out of the psychologist's records. I didn't do that, by the way. I gave them a privilege code and let somebody else decide who had what code. Yeah. But I realized that people, and I, you know, the Cool Hand Luke movie, what yeah. we have here is a failure to communicate. Yeah. So I use that all the time. The VA had a failure to communicate. And how do you address that with computers? So I, uh, and I was uh, very impressed with uh, uh, S.I. Hayakawa's book called Language and Thought and Action and the way that language affects you. So uh, to me, I was creating a speech community. And uh, well, how do you do this? You have to connect people and then you give them the metadata and the ability to, to name things. So what you're saying, the, the wiki pages were kind of a meta definition of, yes. of the space. But you didn't start out with a Dewey Decimal System. Of, no, of, no, of no. I, in fact, I was uh, anti-hierarchical. Yeah. And, now, and some people criticized this. So where's the top level menu? And I said, well, I don't have one. And so where's the entry point? You can enter anywhere. Right. It's a space, not a hierarchy. Yes. And, and, and the namespace, and I think that's part of the, the strength of a wiki, is that it, that it is a space. And you can talk about the future in a sense of, I can write an article about telescopes and mention Galileo and say, I'm going to talk to Galileo here, but without having to find Galileo in advance. That's right. So you're kind of creating a link into the future. I call that future binding. But you can still write, read about telescopes and say, well, we haven't finished uh, Galileo yet. So and, and, and what that does is that makes the incomplete work still valuable. Right. That, that it, you know, to my community, the site was valuable within a week. And in a month, it was really valuable. And it just kept getting more valuable as people were drawn into it. And people who were resistant to participating eventually had to participate anyway because it was becoming the center of a movement. And what I thought was great is because it kept a record that when some late comer showed up, they could read around and they had to follow more links than maybe they wanted to, but they could find out what the definition of this term and that term, and they'd go on these little, you know, uh, uh, I call it foraging for information. It wasn't like it was a nice learn this, then this, then this. There was no table of contents that you might expect from a good book, but it was current and it was relevant and it was something that wasn't going to get written any other way. Yeah. And I think that 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 idea that we assemble the community to accomplish something that only a community could do. It couldn't have been done by an individual. There's no academic smart enough to write that book. Right. I think the other thing you did was the recent changes, uh, transactional listing, so you have a history of the, the record. So there was, I call it a diachronic database, but the flow over time, you could see how this uh, changed and you could revert it. And uh, I, you also have the kind of a futures-oriented recent future changes, yeah, if you will, yeah. through this. So uh, I think you had some really uh, very powerful ideas about the state of the story or the narrative of the page, uh, both uh, past and future, that I think needs to, uh, to grow in uh, the next generation, if you will. So, so uh, of course, my community were all similar. They were all trained as, you know, in the technology they were trying to apply, and they're just looking for better methods to do it. I suppose that, uh, you know, there might have been two or three kinds of computers that, that mattered, but they were still all computers. 
And I think when we talk about medicine and, and, and especially intervention, you know, that, that it's much more diverse and, and the personalities are diverse. And, and this morning we were hearing about uh, 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 cardiac interventionists versus cardiac surgeons and the competition between what uh, uh, before this morning I would have thought was the same discipline, you know. So, so I think that uh, forming a community in that environment must have been much more complex. And, and, uh, and how did you do it? Well, I think uh, it, it relates to uh, incentives. By the way, he didn't talk about radiologists there. Oh. The radiologists and the cardiologists were fighting. Oh my gosh, yeah, okay. And uh, you talk for everybody. Um, well, I, I think you ha we had to come up with a, a, a platform and a tool set that allowed people to compose the system. I, there's no one person that can understand what happens in a hospital. Like you cannot write a manual for what a hospital does and expect it to work. Uh, it's just far too complex. Peter, Peter Drucker calls it the most complex uh, organization in our uh, culture. So the, the complexity is overwhelmingly great. And I, I like to use the uh, analogy of toasters and cats. And a, a toaster is a system that is uh, the whole is equal to the sum of the parts. And if you take the toaster apart, fix all the bad parts and put it back together again, you have a whole toaster. So put a new cord on the broken, break a cord, put a new cord on it, your toaster's okay. Great. Uh, cats, on the other hand, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You dissect a cat and understand all the parts, you can't put it back together again and, and have a whole cat anymore. Uh, if the cat loses its tail, you'd probably do more damage to the cat trying to put it back than to let it be a, a, cat, a tailless cat. So a cat's adaptive, it's resilient, it, it has its own ability to reproduce. So the, you, the, there's two different ways of looking at the, the complexity world, the cat-like and toaster-like. And healthcare is the preeminent cat-like problem in the world. And unfortunately, bureaucracies are the preeminent toaster-like management structure. So uh, HHS comes through with these standards and the meaningful use, or Department of Education does a no child left behind of, of all of these reductionistic, hyper-specific taxonomies, thinking if we just do this taxonomy, we're gonna have a better whole. And the, the, the whole disease model uh, is, if you fix everything that's wrong with the patient, you're gonna have a healthy patient. And that's just totally in contradiction to what we know about health and resilience and adaptability and a beautiful lifestyle. It, it, it's, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And maybe you do lose a leg and you have to use a crutch or something like that, and you can still be a healthy, happy person with a, uh, one leg. You know, okay, it's obvious. But the point is we, we need a, a system that deals with resilience and adaptability and the vitality of health, not just the, the failure modes. And, and, and when you say system, are you thinking of a computer system or are you thinking of that thing that's enabled by the computer system, or are, are we talking about a conversation completely independent of computers? I think computers can be a leading technology to, to drive the, the discussion into a, a new level of, of wholeness and wellness, if you will. Uh, and to me, by the way, the computer was always a tool for organizational transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just the programs. And there, there's a book called, uh, by Philip Longman, uh, why the VA's uh, healthcare is better than yours, or? Best care anywhere. I'm sorry? The best care anywhere. Best care anywhere, there you go. And uh, so that, that organizational transformation has happened, and I think we have to look at it from that level. So to me, the organizational transformation, the communication, the, the computer technology, the ontology, everything was kind of wrapped up into one overarching uh, vision on my part. But I, I think. Uh, so, so, but, but it would be fair to say that VISTA, the computer program, yeah. whatever it was called at the time, was actually the vehicle that brought that transformation to the, to the VA. Is that fair to say? I, I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, some will disagree with that, uh, but uh, I think it, it kind of uh, rototilled the organization chart, shall we say, and let new yeah. stuff <laughs> sprout. Well, uh, well so, so I've <laughs> seen that happen uh, a number of times, and, and of course, you know, the big thing is how people choose to work together and if they help each other be effective. Uh, but but I, I do think technology has, you know, kind of a, a, a special power. And, and I think of it as kind of like a totem, you know, that, that, that there's this thing you can hold, some little technological gizmo, 
and maybe you adopt it because you think you understand it. And being simple helps in this regard. Here's some simple little thing. I'm going to use that because, of course, I understand it. Uh, Wiki, for example, you know, you, you sit, press save and it saves it, and you refresh and it's there. You know, it doesn't, there's, you know, it doesn't even have a name. You put a name on it, it's named. But, but people could use it, and with it came a philosophy, but the philosophy wasn't out, on, out in the front. It wasn't you have to adopt the philosophy, then you can use the tool. It's no, use this tool, and over time you kind of learn the philosophy. And, and so the philosophy was like built into it, it, but it was carried by this technological thing. And I, I think, you know, crafting that kind of uh, a vehicle to carry ideas is uh, still a viable way of affecting very large uh, organizational change. I, I agree 100%. That's why I'm so excited about this. And I, I wish I had the, the button to press to make that happen. I, I, I don't have that clarified in my head yet, but if I talk to you along. Well, we've done it twice. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think, I, I think there's a, a, a big issue to be discussed and that I was a, a interested in a compositional model of, of building tools and giving them out there. And people felt like they had their own uh, system doing this all. And so it was a matter of composition, not decomposition. I wasn't interested in breaking things into the parts of the toaster. But we'd give people electronic mail system. We'd give them the data dictionary. I wanted to give a workflow system that never quite happened. I wanted to create a universal namespace so anything could talk to anything anywhere, uh, not, not through specific APIs. But we just had a, a universal namespace, the same way as the wiki has a namespace for your names that you keep talking about, which I think are very important. But I, I think the, the very interesting thing, by the way, Ward is much more than a wiki person. Uh, this, it's just he's being modest here. But one of the areas that he's. Uh, it's the one thing my neighbors understand. Yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, the pattern languages is another thing that he's uh, a, a giant among computer scientists. And the whole notion of patterns and generative, generativity of a pattern as a way of expressing complexity. So do you want to talk about yeah, that? I, I would love to talk about that because. Uh, that was an idea that excited me and, and that, that it seemed more powerful than most notions that I, I had seen. And, and that is that, well, first of all, the belief that, that uh, uh, we can create the physical structure or the computer structure around us just as we compose uh, complete sentences effortlessly. You know, that the sentences just keep rolling off. I can go on and on and on. And it'd be more or less grammatically correct to the point that you more or less understand me. And that, that is, language is generative. I follow some rules, and I can't remember when I learned them, but I was probably pretty young. And, and that, that idea that I can have a set of rules that generate something that I could value is really important. And, and when we talk about simple, the rules aren't that complex, in spite of my uh, you know, fourth grade teacher making it awfully complex. <laughs> it, it, it's not really that complex. Well, mostly you can break the rules and it still works. Sure. You know, is, is pretty amazing. So, so uh, the question was, why don't we do everything that way? And, and the answer was, well, we pretty much did until we let professionals get involved. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they said, no, 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 it's really much simpler. Yeah. You know, and they made it complex by trying to make it simpler because they didn't understand how uh, uh, some system of rules could generate behavior instead of specifying behavior. And that, that kind of back and forth. Uh, and that's, you know, if I want to say specified behavior, just imagine, you know, a foreign language phrase book. You know, I can say anything that's in the book, right? You know, and I might look it up and use alphabetical order or, okay, here's how I order food or something. And I can say whatever's in the book and I can't say anything more. Well, that's often how we design systems. We feel like, oh, let's just figure out what the customer needs. We'll do a requirements analysis, and we'll figure out how many phrases they need, and then we'll build a computer program that has those phrases in it in some sort of uh, sense. And you know, it turns out it's hard to learn because there's a lot of phrases, and, and it's not particularly empowering. So, so to, to uh, find a way to make uh, language, structure, computer programs, maybe even organization uh, that's generative is, is a real challenge. Now, uh, 
it, I made it simple because I was really only talking to one audience, computer programmers, and I thought they could learn it, especially if they'd ever had a compiler class where they had to make a parser, because that parsed a language that could sure. be infinite in spite of the fact that you had a simple rule. So there's even an analogy. But it turns out most people didn't jump to that analogy, and uh, uh, we, we ended up doing other things. But that, that is something that I think divides a lot of system designers, whether they're able to think in those terms or not. Uh, I would guess a small percentage of people who are even given system design responsibility look for the generative solution. I, I would say that too, and I think it's a level of abstraction. I, I liken it to uh, thinking about things in algebraic terms instead of arithmetic. Yes. So some people want to see a, t a table of rows, you know, the length and the width of the room, and the area is the cell in there. And, yeah. And Bureaucrats love to do it that way. Look at your IRS tables, for yes. example. But uh, the, the idea of having a formula for length times width, and even allowing it to be an irregular shaped room or, or sloping ceilings or whatever, uh, gives you much more f flexibility and freedom. So being able to jump up to the algebraic level or the generativity level as opposed to the specificity level, I think, is, is really critical. And I, I think that the way out of our current healthcare complexity crisis is uh, to recognize that we're inducing incredible amounts of complexity through the 100,000 pages of legislation, the 500% increase in diagnostic codes that are coming with IDC-10. The UMLS has 1.5 million terms for how to be sick. Uh, we have no terms for how to be healthy and resilient and vibrant. We don't know about the positive side of health. We don't have a language for it. We don't have uh, have that generativity baked into the system. So I think in terms of the next generation healthcare system, we have to reach up to this generativity. And the IT uh, computer side of it is just the, the tool to allow people to, to talk generative terms, to talk about health. And the one shining light I see right now is it's called positive psychology. And Martin Seligman and others at uh, Penn have started a, a system uh, DSM-3 is, or 4, was the psychiatric system for how to be sick, you know, uh, psych psychiatrically. And uh, so they turned it upside down and say, how do you be healthy? What's a, what's a healthy, vibrant uh, uh, lifestyle mean psychologically? And they call that character strengths and virtues. So they have an ontology of what's working and, and the strengths, the psychological strengths that give you the ability to, to deal with life. And if you fall down from that and go into a disease state, that's, that's, that's fine. But at least they have a language or an ontology for talking about health. And I think this pattern language stuff that, that uh, Ward is part of a community on, I think there's a, a, a lot of generativity or leads that can be uh, taken out and start talking. What are the patterns of health? What, what, what is vitality? What is a beautiful lifestyle? And start <coughs> designing the system from that perspective, and then dropping down to the specificity, okay, if you need cardiac surgery, great, here's the world's best cardiac surgeon, but th that's, that's uh, uh, many, many layers below the, the health and vitality level. You know, I, I, as I was listening to you, I'm thinking uh, the, the generative solution, which may not be the first thing you think of, that uh, uh, I was driven to it because I just didn't have a budget to do anything else. Yeah. I think you were driven to it because you didn't have a budget sure. to do anything else. Sure. And that uh, having a huge budget or being in an industry with money sloshing around all over uh, might be the very thing that is preventing people from looking for the artful solution and instead looks for the overpowering solution yeah. that will spend our way out of this situation. Yeah. I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. I, I do think we need a certain critical mass to get started on, and I think we need a, uh, uh, a, a, a kind of a core team of people who can think this way mm -hmm. uh, and, and understand the generativity uh, mechanisms of the pattern language. There's a book by Martin Fowler, apparently, mm -hmm. on uh, healthcare pattern languages that I'm going to see if Powell has a copy of right now. But uh, uh, I'm very interested in, in pattern languages. I'm also interested in, uh, uh, call it personalization, mm -hmm. turning the healthcare system upside down, uh, technically around the patient. I wrote a paper called Inverting Our Perspective, Triggering Change, uh, with Rob Kalodner, a previous ONC coordinator. It's looking, money key triggering, you should find it. 
But the, basically, to turn the system around, now the personal health record has been floating around not very successfully because all the money is going into the enterprise record. So it's an enterprise-centric model with the people on the side. And somebody needs to take a much more aggressive stand on that. I think we need to look at uh, personalized medicine. We need to look at social networks and the network effects of health. I think we need to look at genomics and personal genomics and what's going on in that space. It's very early right now, but we need to be ready today. The other thing I've learned in my experience is we can talk all we want and design things, but it's going to be five to eight years before these ideas actually make it into the field and uh, just the, how long it takes to deploy these things. We have to be five to eight years ahead of ourselves in our design, what we're looking at. We have to be looking forward uh, to what healthcare will be, uh, not, well, not what it's been. So I, I think there's, there needs to be a, a vision, there needs to be a group that can pull together these ideas. It's bigger than any one person. But <coughs> um, anyway, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to pull together people and get ideas and, uh, and kind of design the next ge uh, generation and uh, vision of healthcare. So maybe that's a good time to uh, open it up for questions here. Uh, I think we want to we want to kind of stay around ideas, you know, that we've been talking about. So kind of clarification or adding or, or moving around in that before we get off into, you know, I know the the, the 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 field is is huge. So you know, before you bring up your particular, you know, thing, let's 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 kind of stay around here. Okay, we'll repeat the questions. Maybe not faithfully. Uh, a couple of, um, and I, I saw uh, Clay Shirky speak about this recently. He talked a lot about these systems. He talked about uh, cognitive surplus in open source. But I, I always come in healthcare. Where is the cognitive surplus? You know, and you get the Wikipedia, you get the ninety-nine one rule, right? So how can those? How can you take healthcare where there's maybe less cognitive? So, so Clay Shirky, in trying to explain to economists why people wrote the encyclopedia, Wikipedia for free, points out that there's a lot of people with time on their hands and they just, you know, took a small part of their television watching away uh, and, and wrote the encyclopedia in that spare time. Uh, called that the cognitive surplus. There's excess thought. And, and the question is, you know, health that we all struggle with you know, maybe uh, maybe there isn't enough cognitive surplus to uh, uh, to lead us to a better place. I, I think it's a continuum. I think there are certain things that that are uh, network affectable. Uh, Cure together, talking about how migraines work, and to to talk about how I cured my migraine and, and follow a survey, I, I think is good. Now, how to do good, you know cardiac surgery is is not the same kind of a problem and. Uh, so that's something very transactional. It, it, it is probably hierarchical in, in many ways. You don't just kind of adapt your way through a surgery. You know, you have a thousand steps, you've got to hit them. And uh, so there's this continuum. And the, the question is, how far can the continuum go? Um, and where, where does it come from? Uh, and what, what do you trust? I mean, do you trust the big pharma telling you that this drug is going to cure your depression? Or you discuss uh, the, the, some runner's world forum that says, geez, if you run six miles a day, you lose your depression. Uh, so it, it's a matter of trust and, and continuum. That, that's one thing. The other one is that there's, there's a, a whole scale continuum between global health, community health, population health, personal health, your immune system health, the DNA health, and nanotech. So there's a slider of, of continuum that's kind of a fractal view of health. And that's a whole other level that all we're looking at today is just the transactions between what HHS is calling consumers instead of patients and the provider, or we used to be doctors. So that all we've, we've taken this huge continuum of both physical scale and then the, the scale of severity and turned it all into just this, this hyper-specific interaction. Yeah. You're in the process of reinventing the wiki. So I've, after 
16 years decided to have another go at wiki. The technology is different enough and, and I, I certainly don't intend to replace the encyclopedia which is a, a, is a very highly evolved form of wiki but uh, especially for sharing data, I think that data uh, can uh, escape the spreadsheet and be better off for it and I think that something that feels wiki-ish my friends ask me, I say, now that I understand it, why do you call it a wiki? And I say, I do because I can. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I attract attention that way. But no, I, I, I think it relates, uh, I'm not sure it's the same as a personal health record, but I think it could become uh, outcomes-oriented advice for a lot of challenging questions that I think we'll all face as we uh, find a need to lead a different life. And, and I'm not taking a, a health uh, industry perspective, I'm, I'm taking a sustainability perspective. You know, I tell my friends I don't think of it as, as peak oil, I think of it as peak traffic and look forward to uh, not being in the car so much. And, and that, that kind of transformation backed up with solid evidence that helps people make that transition, uh, I, I think that we can find a world that, that isn't quite so energy bountiful could actually be st still a nice place to live. And that's, that's what I hope to create in the, uh, the smallest federated wiki is the medium where people can have the discussion about how we're going to lead our lives. I've been looking at it with him, uh, what he's doing with it, and I, I think there's uh, a glimmer of a tool set that could be used for this this meta-level knowledge base, if you will, uh, of, there's a, a, a call the info button. I think OHSU here is developing it, but it's a way of linking up to a knowledge layer from a clinical record. And uh, managing this info layer of genomics, uh, social networks, the latest research and everything. And I, I, I think I see some linkages between his idea of federation and this federated knowledge base of, of health. So it, it's, it's early, though. Yes. I know you got that rush invitation to speak to Congress. What did you want them to get? What did they get? And has there been conversation since, particularly with staff? Uh, I was actually hiking in the Cascades last year on a vacation on a golf. Got a call from the Senate to ask to testify in the future of health IT. I have five minutes exactly, and was told my microphone would be cut off if I didn't uh, if I talk too long. So I had to compress it pretty de definitely. The, the message we, we don't do that here. <laughs> 55 minutes. <laughs> and we have three left. I, I, I wanted to push personalization. I think the, what I see is this massive centralization and mega, mega everything in, in health care. Uh, and I, I, I don't think it's health inducing. I think we need to go to the other way, turn the whole system upside down around the individual. And the technology is there. The, the, the incentives are there. I think most rational people would say it's supposed to be there. It's just a matter of time before personalization takes off. So I got the message across whether they heard it. I don't know. Uh, I, one thing I, I would uh, keep asking people, uh, we use health care when we mean medical care. Uh, I've heard it might be used. Uh, health care is like oil shampoos. Medical care is like tote trucks. And we do not <laughs> talk about empowering people in health care, I mean, these people are the only people, or are the only actors in the, in the process that can actually provide that. Uh, so, so to repeat that, uh, the observation was that uh, uh, when we speak of health care, we should be talking about changing your oil, and medical care is uh, uh, seeing a doctor. Seeing a doctor. Seeing a doctor and, and the tow truck, right. Don't, and, and that we should really emphasize health, which I think you have another word for. You call it uh, vitality, vitality or flourishing or something like yeah. that. We just need to even, even the word health is sort of tainted out of this confusion. And that, that we have to actively uh, overcome that confusion that is, that is buried into our language. And, and, and if you're asking if I believe that, I, I certainly do. Sure. I, I think you do too. Yeah. It, and we just need a language for it. In terms of personal, so healthcare then would be personal, and medical care would be outcome or treatment from, from your life? Uh, 
I, I, well, I, I think that, uh, repeat the question. I, I, I think there was a actually asking for a clarification of the exact use of terms there, okay. and I didn't quite hear what you said, and I don't think that we're actually proposing terms, we're actually proposing a different philosophy. You know, and, and whatever the terms are, as long as people realize, you know, who owns the responsibility and who's going to be effective at uh, leading a healthy and flourishing life, uh, you know, that, that, it, that it doesn't come from your doctor. I think pulling together some of the things that you, you both said, uh, uh, you, you mentioned about the spreadsheet and sort of bringing that into the wiki. And if you, you had, and then you were talking about the uh, creating that knowledge layer. If you actually look at the way people tend to use spreadsheets, say in a, in a business context, you produce a number, you budget, but mostly you then spend time discussing how to get to those numbers and what do they mean. And that's, the, I think, the same thing that we're at with, with healthcare or you know, as against the sick care system. Is we, we need to be able to, to get at that data, but we also need to value the narrative part of being able to discuss the context and the meaning of those, those numbers. And yeah, that, yeah, that, 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 that is exactly the, the, the observation. I almost wish I didn't say spreadsheet because I actually really admire spreadsheet. It's a fabulous uh, invention, but it's actually pretty old. And, and it does kind of put the focus on the number. Uh, and, and if you wrote the number, you can see the story but it doesn't really communicate the story. And I think that you know, people hear the word data and they think cold and boring, but uh, then they tell crazy stories that have no grounding in fact or measurement or outcome. And what I, what I want to do is I want to make, in a sense, I want to make data be sexy, exciting, uh, a hot medium instead of a cold medium mm -hmm. by combining a story with it that people want to hear, but to hold that story to something that is defensible instead of fantasy, you know, to take the fantasy out of uh, how we should lead our lives and, and, and kind of ground it in things that are shown to work. So it's been able to take the, that data and maybe even visualize it. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's one of the big things. You look at things like Google Health and the power wasn't so much in the user interface because that basically sucked. The power was in being able to pull lots of different data together. Yeah. And what we really needed was the ability to maybe measure if, if this change is in one area, how does that relate to data in another? You know, so yeah. like the steps I take versus my blood pressure. So the, 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 so the observ uh, because you're not on a mic, I'm gonna try to repeat that, that, uh, and I'm not sure I could, you said it very well. But let me just say as we're kind of winding up here, that uh, I'm, I'm making a stab at another uh, generative system that has kind of built into a core data and storytelling and sharing where we can choose to disagree but we still feel the benefit from finding agreement. And, and I think that, uh, you know, of course I'm a technologist so it's a technology but I, I, I think it will be exciting. And I look forward to a year from now to having a camp about it. Do we do we have time for one more question? We uh, no, it's your time. You, you do. I'm sorry to ask two questions, but the one thing that keeps popping up, and the one interesting thing that really doesn't seem to didn't follow through on on the original idea of the National Health Information Network was that the information was always owned and controlled by the individual. And we keep hearing a lot today about uh, patient-centered uh, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Could you talk about what it's gonna take to make individuals get involved? What kind of tools are needed? And because it, in the end, it's not the doctor who, just, who, who treats you, it's you yourself. Well, I would use the question is, uh, what, what's going to take to get the personal involved rather than the, the enterprise? And uh, it's kind of like saying, what's, what's it going to take to get people to use Wikipedia back when there was almost anything, nothing on Wikipedia? It had to be an attractor. It had to be charming. It had to have this sense of 
a value, I, I could call it beauty or vitality to Wikipedia that pulled people into it. Uh, it, it wasn't created by the stakeholders of, uh, at the time. It wasn't the Encyclopedia Britannica or World Book that made Wikipedia work, obviously. They fought it. So we have the, the power structures and, the, and the, 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 the hierarchical control today in the enterprise, and they don't want to give that up. They want you to come to them. They want to create that dependency. If you want to create a self-efficacy, self-efficacious self-care system, you have to build the tools and let it start simple and grow and evolve over time. So you, you can't, Tim Berners-Lee, when he invented the web, didn't invent Google. He created this chaotic mess of URLs, Google emerged. So we need to start simple, we need to have our foundation, the conceptual integrity of the system, and then let it evolve over time. So, so if I can wind up with, uh, just to uh, recap that, the, the, it hasn't happened yet. You know, we have a lot of uh, people leading not particularly healthy lives. We've got a lot of uh, cost piling up in, uh, as, the, as that population ages. And so I think we can say that we need to do something. Some action is called for. And I think we both agree that that action, when it's successful, we'll look at it and we'll say, yes, another simple solution that understood uh, the whole problem and captured it in some way that appreciated the whole problem. Uh, maybe it's patterns or maybe it's something inspired by patterns or something like that, but patterns is the kind of powerful, thoughtful thing that could tackle large-scale problems and that uh, because the system that we have today isn't working, I think it's reasonable for all of us to, uh, to speculate, in fact, even put real serious energy into uh, to, to making a system that is simple and powerful enough that it can solve well, tomorrow's I'm problem. Just say I'd also posit that, um, oh, after such a beautiful summarization, you're going <laughs> to oh, add yeah, one yeah, more yeah, comment. I want to try to stop before I just mention that. I mean, the, the data shows that people fall out of the healthcare system between the ages of 20 and 40. And I think it has a lot to do with the language and also our, the way we're socialized towards sick care and towards the healthcare. that zone where they fall out for 20 years it has a tremendous effect on their health, but also on the way they interact with society. Well, I'm going to change the name of our next session because of this presentation is to uh, data this <laughs> you, you know, I think we'll have to take the question offline if that's all right, because I think we do need to get on to the rest of the schedule, or, or it'll be the, the Ward and Tom show all afternoon. Mind you, it's been a fascinating uh, session. Uh, thank you both well, for leading oh, that. Yeah,